Good evening. I'm Brenda Wood. Welcome to Dimensions of Prophecy. Is heaven real? A lot of people believe heaven's going to be a place where you'll be an invisible spirit, floating on an invisible cloud, playing an invisible harp that makes an inaudible sound. Just exactly what is heaven going to be like? Tonight, Pastor Kenneth Cox is going to be dealing with this question in his heartwarming presentation, Reunion Day in Heaven. We'll find just how heaven is described in scripture. Listen carefully and learn four ways to recognize your loved ones there. And Pastor Cox will tell you about two individuals who went to heaven and came back to this earth. Don't miss what they had to say about heaven. Just think, Reunion Day in Heaven will be the first day of the rest of our lives. Lives without heartache, deformities, disease, and sickness, even without death. And we'll have no more worry about famine and war. This subject, Reunion Day in Heaven, is possibly one of the most comforting topics in all the Bible. Let's go directly to the crusade to meet Pastor Kenneth Cox and his team. Thank you very much. We're very happy to welcome each of you again tonight. Appreciate you being here. So nice to see the place full. Everybody here. It kind of reminds me of Tennessee Ernie Ford. He uh, attended a Methodist church, and the church that he attended, the pastor got up one Sunday morning when the church was packed and there wasn't a seat anywhere, and he said to the congregation, bless your pew-packing hearts, you know, and so I kind of feel the same way. We're just very happy that each of you are here. Appreciate you being here. Tonight we're going to talk about heaven. And actually, if you and I were to stop the first dozen people that we met and ask them where heaven was, most people would say, well, heaven's up there somewhere. And that's about all that most people know about heaven. But there's not any reason for there to be as much ignorance as much misunderstanding about heaven as there is because the scripture paints some very, very beautiful things about heaven. Tonight we're going to look at those, see what the scripture says about it. Notice what it has to say here in a text over in 2 Corinthians, the 12th chapter in verse 2. Paul is speaking and he said, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in the body I do not know or whether out of the body I do not know, God knows such a one was caught up to the third heaven. Now, Paul said he knew somebody who was caught up unto the third heaven. And if you study 2 Corinthians very carefully, you'll find that Paul is talking about himself, that he was taken in vision up to the third heaven. Now, listen as he continues. How he was caught up into where? Paradise and heard inexpressible words which it is not lawful for a man to utter. So Paul says that he was caught up unto the third heaven, that he was caught up into paradise. I told you that I'd tell you about two people that went to heaven and came back. And those two people that went to heaven was Paul and John. Both of them were taken to heaven in vision tonight we're going to see a lot of things that Paul and John had to say about heaven. But Paul says he was caught up into what? Paradise, and he called it the what? The third heaven. So the Bible speaks of three heavens. I'm sure you've read in Revelation where it says that when Jesus comes back, he's going to create a new heaven and a new earth. You see, the first heaven the Scripture talks about is what we call our atmosphere. It's where the birds fly. It's the air that you and I breathe. That's the first heaven, and we find that that heaven has been polluted. So when Jesus comes back, he's going to make that heaven completely new. That's the first heaven. The second heaven that the Bible talks about is what is known as the stellar heaven. It says the heavens declare the glory of God. That's the stellar heaven. But Paul said... He was caught up into the third heaven, into paradise. That's where the throne of God is, the third heaven, paradise. A lot of people wondered about that. When I was in school, college, came to my last year, my professor called me in and he said, I've just gone through your 
transcript and all, and he said, I noticed that you're short a math course. You're going to have to take one more math course. You know, I'd taken some algebra and some geometry, but that's about it. And so I got the college bulletin out and started going through it, trying to find a math course for a preacher. And uh, looked through it, and finally I noticed that they offered a course in astronomy. And so I signed up for astronomy. Let me tell you something, that's not a math course for a preacher. You know, I thought we'd learn the names of the stars and do that kind of thing. Uh, we spent all of our time figuring out how far it was from here to Doobie and Mayrack and Battle Geese and that kind of thing. I never got into so much trigonometry in all my life. But I did find out one thing. There's a constellation out there by the name of Orion. And there are quite a number of astronomers, scientists, that believe that that constellation has a hole in it. Because when you look at it through the telescope, it seems to open into another heaven, the third heaven, where the paradise of God is. Paul says he was caught up unto the third heaven, that heaven where God's throne is. You remember, don't you, when Russia sent off their cosmonaut? You remember that time they sent that first cosmonaut off? He got in his Sputnik and circled the earth and all. You remember what he said when he got back? Yeah, he got back here to the earth, and the first thing he said when he got out of his Sputnik, he said, there's no God. He said, I flew all over heaven and did, didn't see God anywhere. And I felt so sorry for him because he was flying around in the second heaven. He wasn't even in the right one, you know. <laughs> You're going to see God. He's in the third heaven, the paradise of God. That's what we're going to look at tonight is this third heaven. And it says, and he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. It says that he saw there the throne of God. And by the way, dear friend, if you never have taken a good look at the throne of God, I'd invite you to read the fourth chapter of the book of Revelation. It describes the throne of God very beautifully there. And it says that out of God's throne flowed this river, clear as crystal. And in the middle of its street, on either side of the river, was the tree of life. Are you understanding that text? Are you getting what it says when it says there? In the middle of its street? Do you understand what that's saying? That's saying there's a divided highway. That's what you need to understand. That's what it's saying. There's a divided highway running to God's throne, and in the middle of that divided highway flows the river of life. On either side of the river, there is the tree of life which bore twelve fruits, yielded its fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nation. It says that that tree of life bore its fruit every month. A different fruit every month. One of a great friend of mine, uh, Dr. H.M.S. Richards, back when he was alive, he said that that many would bear twelve different varieties of mangoes. Now, I don't know that that is true, but... Uh, nevertheless, it says the tree of life would bear a fruit every month, and the people would come up and eat from that. It describes this city very beautifully. In fact, it is a city that the Bible says that Jesus Christ has prepared, made with his own hands. John 14, verse 1 says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places, if it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be what? Also. So he says he's going to come back, he's going to gather all of his people, and he's going to take them to this city that Jesus Christ has prepared with his own hands, that he's made for you, prepared for each one of us. It's a special place. Let's listen as the Scripture now begins to describe the city and tell us what it's like. And he carried me away in the Spirit to a great and high mountain. Now John is telling us what he saw. 
showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. So John said, took him to this great mountain, and there he sees this city coming down from God. And this is what he sees. Having the glory of God in her light was like a most precious stone, like a jasper, clear as crystal. Do you know what a jasper stone is? You know, we read that all the time in the Bible about jasper. Do you know what it's talking about? There, when it uses that word jasper, it's talking about diamond. It says that that city is clear as crystal, like diamond, as it comes down from God out of heaven. She had a great and high wall, had 12 gates and 12 angels at the gates, and the name written on them, which are the name of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. So it says that around this city is a great wall. That wall is over 200 feet high. It says that it has 12 gates. And it says that over the top of each gate is written one of the names of the tribes of Israel. You ever thought about that? What gate are you going to go through? Now, you've got to go through one of the gates. You know you can't crawl over the wall. You're aware of that, aren't you? So you're going to have to go through one of those gates. Why? Why would it write over the top of the gate one of the names of the tribes of Israel? Why would it do that? Because if you turn to the 49th chapter of Genesis, you'll find there that Jacob, Israel, tells the characteristics of his sons. He says, Reuben, this is the kind of son you are, and he describes him. And then he says, Manasseh, this is the way you are, and Ephraim, this is how you are, and Levi, this is the way you are, and he describes each one of them. Psychiatrists tell us that all of mankind fits into one of those 12 characters, 12 personalities, and according to your personality, according to your character, you're going to go in through that gate into the city. You see, dear friend, there's none of you that can say, well, I'll tell you, when God passed out virtue, I was just behind the door. There's something wrong with me because there's a lot of people just like you and they're going to make it and you can make it. Nobody's going to be left out. So over each gate, is written one of the names of the tribes of Israel. It goes on and says, three gates on the east, three gates on the north, three gates on the south, and three gates on the west. So it says that on each side of the city are three gates. And by the way, the scripture says that each one of those gates is made out of one pearl. Now, I hope you're beginning to sense just a little bit of what we're talking about because this city is like diamond. It says that the streets are made out of gold. It says that the wall is clear as crystal. It says that each one of those gates is made out of one pearl. And dear friend, that wall is over 200 feet high and those gates are going to be in proportion. So I hope you're beginning to sense just a little bit of what a magnificent city this is. Marvelous what God has prepared for his people. And it says the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them are the name of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. So it says that the city, it has 12 foundations to it. On each foundation is written one of the names of the disciples. Now, if you want to take your Bible, turn over there to the 22nd chapter and 21st chapter of Revelation it will tell you the name of each one of the stones of that foundation. It says that one foundation is made out of onyx and one of beryl and one of jasper and it goes on and names each one of them. And if you want to have an interesting study tonight, you go home and get out your Bible and get your dictionary out and you look up the name of each one of those stones and when you look it up in the dictionary, it'll tell you its color and you'll find that it makes the color of the rainbow. Those foundations does. So it says the foundations are the color of the rainbow. That city is like clear glass. Streets are of gold. Gates are of pearl. Now he begins to tell us a little bit about the size of the city. 
And he who talked with me had a golden reed to measure the city, its gates, and its wall. The city is laid out as a square. Its length is as great as its breadth. He measured the city with a reed, 12,000 furlongs. Its length, breadth, and height are equal. So it says that the city around it is 12,000 furlongs. Now there happens to be eight furlongs in one mile. So if you divide 8 into 12,000, it will tell you that it is 1,500 miles around that city. That city is 375 miles on a side. That means if one corner of the city was here, the other corner would be over beyond Phoenix. So you begin to get a little bit of an idea of the size of that city. Huge. We don't even understand cities like that, folks. We don't even comprehend. It's a huge city. It says the length and the breadth and the height of it are equal. That means in proportion. And I have people say, oh, Brother Cox, I'm not concerned about going to heaven because there won't be room for me there. I want to ask you something. Whoever told you that the buildings in the New Jerusalem are going to be one story? Whoever told you that? Not with walls over 200 feet high. Not hardly, dear friend. There is more than enough room for you there. Listen. And he measured the wall 144 cubits according to the measure of a man. That is of an angel. You know what a cubit is? I'll simply tell you how to remember what a cubit is. A cubit happens to be the distance from right here to right there. That's one cubit. And that wall is over 200 feet high. 375 miles long, and the construction of the wall was of jasper, and the city was pure gold, light, clear glass. Now, to give you a little idea of the size of this city, this happens to be the Twin Towers in New York City. Those are the tallest buildings in New York City. They're actually taller than the Empire State Building. Two of them there. Would you like to venture a guess as to how many people work in one of those buildings? Not both of them, just one of them. I'm talking about how many people work in just one of those buildings. Well, over 25,000 people work in one building. Now, dear friend, let me tell you, you want to know how big the city is? I'm going to show you how big the New Jerusalem is. This is a map of New York in that area, and you can see New York City here, and that dot is not quite as big as my thumb. A few years ago, I happened to be in New York City on Christmas Eve by myself. And let me tell you another secret. There is no place on earth as lonesome as New York City on Christmas Eve by yourself. No place on earth. Now, I didn't know what to do, so I decided I'd go down to the Empire State Building. I went down there, and I caught the elevator, and I went up to the observation deck. And the man that was running the elevator, I guess he was as lonesome as I was. Because when we got up to the top, he just locked the elevator and went out on the observation deck with me. We were standing there looking at the city. Clear night. And he told me, he said, with your naked eye tonight, you can see where 23 million people live. 23 million people. That's in this little spot right here, folks. 23 million people live. Now, I'm going to put the New Jerusalem on that map in exactly the same scale that that map is in, and I'll show you how big it is. That's the size of the New Jerusalem. You see, it runs clear up into Canada. It comes across and picks up Pennsylvania. It comes on down and picks up Maryland, New York, Massachusetts, Connecticut. All those cities can fit inside the New Jerusalem. In fact, if you want to figure it out, there is enough room in the New Jerusalem to take care of 39 billion people. 
Don't let me ever hear you say there's not room for you. There's room for anybody that wants to go. He has made ample provision for every person. But it tells us that you and I can't even imagine what heaven is going to be like. Paul said, but as it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. Oh, it just says that the most beautiful music that you have ever listened to won't compare to the music of heaven. The most beautiful sight that you have ever seen in this world won't compare to heaven. In fact, it says you can't even imagine. Have you ever had problems like I did when I was a child? Did you ever have trouble with anticipation being greater than reality? Did you ever have any troubles like that? Boy, I have. When I was growing up, I can remember we went into town, and here were signs up all over town about the circus coming to town. And when we got back to school, of course, all of us children played circus. We played circus for about two weeks. We flew from trapezes, we had huge lions and elephants and everything you could think of. And then we went to the circus, and man, it wasn't near as good as what we imagined. Never will that be the case regarding heaven. Never will be the case. It says that you and I just can't even imagine how wonderful heaven will be. It goes on and says, and there shall be no more curse but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. Nothing is going to hurt. Nothing is going to destroy in all of God's kingdom, and they shall see his face. His name shall be in their forehead. Oh, just think of what it's going to be to reach out and take somebody's hand and find that to be God's hand. I think of that song that we sing, Face to Face with Christ my Savior. Face to face, what must it be? When in rapture I behold him, Jesus Christ that died for me. Oh, how wonderful when we'll be able to see Jesus, that he'll be there. It also goes on and says, Violence shall no more be heard in your land, neither wasting nor destruction within your borders, but you shall call your walls salvation and your gates praise. We won't have to worry any more about such things as floods, tornadoes, earthquakes, war. All that will be gone. Nothing is going to hurt nor destroy in all of God's kingdom. There won't be violence there anymore. That will all be something of the past. Just won't happen. Isaiah 11 and verse 6 says, And the wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, the leopard shall lie down with the young goat, the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. Oh, it says the animals won't be vicious anymore. They're going to be tame. Won't be any problems of death. When I was first pastoring, we moved to a little place called Del Hart, Texas. I don't know if any of you know where Del Hart, Texas is, but it's over in the panhandle of Texas. My daughter was very young at that time, and we drove into this little town, and as we drove in, here was a little private zoo. And she said, Daddy, let's go to the zoo. And I said, now, honey, when we get settled and get moved and all, we'll, we'll go to the zoo one day. And so one day I said to her, I said, would you like to go to the zoo? And she said, yes. So my daughter and wife and I went to the zoo, and we got down there, and the man that owned it uh, gave us a private tour through his zoo, showed us his skunks and his possums and his raccoons and the snakes. And really, for a little private zoo, it was quite nice. And after we'd gone all through it and was about ready to leave, he said, I want to show you one other thing. And he took us over there to a large tin building, we walked in the front door, and in the far end of that building was two great big cages. In one of them was a great big male lion, and in the other one was a female lion. Didn't excite me, didn't bother me particularly because I'd seen lions in cages many times before. 
But when we walked in the door, this fellow quickened his pace and walked off and left us. Walked over there and pulled the pin on that door to that great big male line and opened the door and that line came out and that excited me <laughs> very much. And he said now, he said, he won't hurt you. He said he's just as tame as a kitten and sure enough, the old male lion was. He'd just rub up against you and you could pull on his mane just as tame as a kitten. That's the way the animals will be in heaven. It says that a little child will lead them. Nothing will hurt nor destroy in all of God's kingdom. It would be a marvelous place as it describes God's people. But it also says in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 12, But now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I also am what? Known. It says we're going to know one another, friends. Oh, we're not going to be some invisible spirit floating around on some cloud somewhere. It says we're going to know one another there. Listen as it continues. Our, for our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body. That's this body now. He's going to transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his what? His glorious body. So what it says is that our bodies are going to be made like his glorious body. Now, when it talks about the glorious body of Christ, what's it talking about? Well, it's really talking about Christ's body after the resurrection. So if we want to know what we're going to be like, all we have to do is look and see what Jesus was like after the resurrection. See if we can understand, if we can know one another. Listen very carefully. The disciples are in this room when all of a sudden Jesus comes in. And as they said these things, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and said to them, Peace be with you. So it says that Jesus walked in the room. Listen what happens. And they were terrified and frightened, supposed they had seen a spirit. I mean, he walked in there, and they thought they were seeing a ghost, a spirit. Now he begins to talk to them. And he said to them, Why are you troubled, and why do doubts arise in your hearts? Behold my hand and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones, as you see I have. He said, Come here, touch me, feel me. He said, Thomas, you're the one that said you wouldn't believe until you put your finger in the nail print and your hand into my side. He said, Come me, come, touch, feel. For a spirit hath not flesh and bones, as you see I have. Very, very real person. How did they recognize him? Huh? Well, they recognized him by his looks. They saw him, they recognized him. You and I will recognize our loved ones by their looks. It's the way we'll know them. Now, I know there's some of you saying, Oh, my. All this time I thought I was going to look different. Well, let me tell you something. Doesn't make any difference who you are. The Bible says that there will be no imperfections there. And you take any individual, and if you take away all the imperfections, all the blemishes, all the wrinkles, everybody would be absolutely beautiful. So you don't have to worry about that. But they recognized each other by their looks. Now notice it continues, telling us how they recognized Jesus. Because you remember, Mary... Mary has gone to the tomb while it's still dark. She's gotten there. The stone has been rolled away. She's looked in, and Jesus is not there. And she thinks somebody has robbed the grave, and she's crying. It's dark. She can't see well. It's dark. She can't see the person when Jesus speaks to her. And when he spoke to her, she recognized him by his voice. Jesus said to her, Mary, she turned and said to him, Rabboni, which is to say, teacher, she knew him by his voice. And so you and I will recognize our loved ones by their voices. It's the same resurrection day. 
two men are walking down to the city of Emmaus when Jesus comes and starts walking with them. And so it was while they conversed together and reasoned that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. Now follow carefully. But their eyes were, what? Restrained so they did not know him. God did not permit those two disciples to recognize him by his looks. Their eyes were restrained. They walk all the way down to the city of Emmaus. When they get there, these two disciples invite him to come to their house and have a bite to eat. Jesus goes to their house, has a bite to eat with them. It came to pass as he sat at the table with them that he took bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. Now, you've got to understand, these are followers of Jesus. They followed him for at least three years here. They have seen him dozens of times take bread, break it, and bless it. They've seen him do that many, many times. The moment he took that bread and blessed it and broke it, this is what happened. And their eyes were opened and they knew him and he vanished from their sight. You see, they recognized him by his characteristics, the way he did things. You see, all of us have certain idiosyncrasies that are different than anybody else and we recognize our loved ones and friends by those many times and so they knew Jesus by the way he did certain things. That's three. I told you I would tell you four ways to recognize your loved ones. The fourth one, I'm afraid, only applies to women. I'm not saying that a man can't do it. Not saying that. I just don't know of one that can. There may be some men that can. I have a brother that's about uh, three years older than I. My parents didn't put very many restrictions on us when we were growing up. And I want to say to the young people here, that's not good. Just don't think that that's all right. Our parents never told us when we had to come home at night. All my father ever said was, you better be here in time to milk the cows in the morning. And he meant that. So my brother and I would come home many times late at night. I didn't want to wake anybody up, so I wouldn't turn any lights on. I walked through the living room very carefully so I didn't bump into the furniture and quietly so I wouldn't wake anybody up. Never once in my entire life did I ever get through that living room that my mother didn't say, Kenneth, is that you? <laughs> Never once. I asked my brother, I said, when you come home at night, does mother speak to you? He said, always. I said, did she ever call you my name? Never. She knew us by our walk alone. I don't think you're going to have any trouble recognizing your loved ones, friend. It says that we shall be known even as we are known is what it promises. But let's listen to what else it has to say about it. It says, then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Oh, it says, the people who have never seen are going to see. You ever talk to somebody who's been blind all their life, born blind? You want to have an interesting conversation? Talk to somebody who's been blind from birth. Try to explain to them what the color blue is. But boy, it says their eyes are going to open. They're going to see that person who has never been able to hear. They're going to hear. All right, it continues on and it even says, Then the lame shall leap like a deer and the tongue of the dumb sing, for the water shall burst forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. Oh, those people, there's not going to be anybody there, dear friend, that'll have to have a handicap. Everybody, everybody, will be healthy. They're going to be strong. They're going to see. They're going to hear. Not going to be lame. They're not going to be without an arm or without a leg. God's going to take care of all that. It also says, the inhabitants shall not say, I am sick. The people who dwell there, dwell in it, will be forgiven their iniquities. 
Nobody's going to say I'm sick. Every time I read that text, I get a little amused because visiting people, and sometimes I'll run on to a person, and I'll say, how you doing? They say, oh, my head has hurt me all day long. And a few days later, I'll see that person, and I'll say, how are you today? They say, oh, my back is killing me. And a few days later, I'll see them again, and I'll say, how you doing today? And they say, oh, my knee has hurt me. Tells me that person's going to have to learn to talk over. Nobody will say I'm sick. In all of God's kingdom, there just won't be that there. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. There won't be atomic bombs. There won't be hydrogen bombs. There won't be chemical warfare. None of that will be there. It's all going to be gone. It's going to be peaceful. It's going to be wonderful. None of those things that you and I have experienced will be in God's kingdom. Do you like to eat? Huh? Do you like to eat? I do. I believe that eating is a blessing that's been given to us by God. Now, I understand that there are some people that overdo the blessing. I realize that, you know. But God says he's prepared a lot of wonderful things. You ever read in the Bible about when they sent out the spies into the land of Canaan? Huh? And they told them to bring back a sample of the fruit of the land. It says they brought back one bunch of grapes. Scripture says that that one bunch of grapes was so large that they had to take a pole and stick it through it, and it took two men to carry it. Now, dear friends, this book, if you want to study this book, the book says this old earth has been cursed three times. That's what it says. That's the reason it doesn't grow as well as it probably should. But I just want to tell you that this old earth, after it's been cursed three times, still grows some pretty nice things. In fact, I'm going to put a picture up here on the screen of two apples. This is not trick photography. I'm going to put a picture up here of two delicious apples. The small delicious apple is a regular sized delicious apple about that big around. That's the small one. That big one weighs over two and a half pounds. There's a nursery called the Stark Brothers that grow apples that size. Now just think what it's going to be in the new earth when God will let us grow things and the earth has not been cursed, all the wonderful things that will be there. You know, I always enjoy this time of the year so much because I dearly love peaches. I like peaches. And when it comes time, I can hardly wait to get my hands on a nice, great, big, ripe, juicy peach. Oh, enjoy that so much. But it's going to be so nice to get to heaven, to find a great, big, ripe, juicy peach, and to bite into it and not have to worry about the worm having beaten me there. It's going to be so nice. All the wonderful things that God has prepared for his people. It says that we will eat from the tree of life. It's going to come each month. Pick fruit from the tree of life. Eat all the wonderful things that God has prepared for his people. In fact, it says in Matthew 5, 5, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the what? The earth. They certainly haven't inherited it today. But the day's coming and when God's going to make this earth completely new. It's going to become the home of all of God's people. I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. There was no more sea. You see the sea out here covers about two-thirds of the earth. And so it says that the sea's going to be done away with. That doesn't mean there won't be water. They're just not going to be vast oceans as there is. There's going to be land for people to inhabit. You've got to remember that out of God's throne flows the river of life. There's going to be water there, but there's not going to be huge oceans like we know today. And I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. It's going, this new Jerusalem is going to come to this earth. This is going to become the home 
of all of God's people. Now, I can tell you, this old earth has a lot of uninhabitable places in it today. For it says, the wilderness and the wasteland shall be glad for them. The desert shall rejoice and blossom as a rose. It says that out here, these deserts, God's going to take them. They're going to blossom like a rose. The sea is going to disappear, and that land's all going to become places for God's people to live. In fact, it says that God's going to take this present world, and he's going to burn it. Looking for and hastening to the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens being on fire will be dissolved, the elements will melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. God's going to burn this earth, and after it has been burned, then he's going to make it new. It's going to become the home of all of God's people. It's going to be completely a different place, different than what it has been. It's going to become the home of his people. They shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat the fruit of them. Did you catch what that said? Huh? Are you thinking? I hope you're turning the cog. It says they shall build houses and inhabit them. Do you know what that's saying? That's saying you're going to have two homes. You're putting it together? There's a home in the city that Jesus has made says that he's preparing a place for you. So you're going to have a home in the city, but you're going to have a home out in the country that you're going to build yourself. Just think what it's going to be like to be able to build a home yourself when you don't have to worry about resources. I mean, you can make it out of anything you want to. I've already started making plans. Haven't you? Man, I'm planning on going. I'm planning on going. Are you? Sure, I've already started making plans. I'm going to have one wall in that house made out of diamonds. A wall. Wall on the other side I'm going to have out of living roses. Just think how pretty that'll be as those roses reflect in that diamond wall. How nice it'll always smell. It's going to be wonderful. We'll have a house there. It says that we're going to plant vineyards, eat the fruit of them. They shall not build another inhabit. They shall not plant another eat. For as the days of a tree, so shall be the days of my people. My elect shall long enjoy the works of their hands. Oh, it says very clearly that we're going to plant vineyards and we're going to eat the fruit of them. Dear friend, you're not going to sit around on some cloud for eternity. We're going to be real people. We're going to do the real things, the most fantastic things that man has ever dreamed of he will carry out there. We're going to real, be real people. We're going to have homes that we're going to build. We're going to do things. Last thing I want to do is sit around for 50 million years. Talk about being bored. We're going to be real people. We'll have things to do that God has prepared for his people. Continues on and says, For a new heavens and a new earth which I will make shall remain before me, saith the Lord. So shall your seed and your name remain. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another shall all flesh come to worship before me, saith the Lord. How often do you have a new moon? Every month. How often does the tree of life bear its fruit? Every month. So once every month, all of God's people are going to come from all over the earth, and they're going to come up to the new Jerusalem, and there they're going to eat of the tree of life, and there they're going to worship the Lord, and just think of what it's going to be to listen to the angelic choirs it sings. To so hear Jesus Christ speak, Never a man spoke like this man. Oh, how wonderful. Wonderful place that God has prepared for his people. In fact, it says, Blessed are those who do his commandments, 
that they may have right to the tree of life, may enter in through the gates into the city. It says that all of God's people are going to come into that city. Here in the United States, one of our large cities in the east, back several years ago, and that portion of the city was a very poor section of town. There was a pastor there by the name of Pastor Black. Had a church, but he had a problem. You see, I don't know who did this. I'd like to know who was responsible, but I don't. But somehow we've given people the idea that you've got to dress a certain way to go to church. And since these people were poor, Many of them wouldn't go to church because they just didn't feel like they had the clothes to wear. And so Pastor Black started having church out in the park. Every week he would have church in the park, and he hoped, particularly for the children, he hoped that by getting acquainted with the children, he could get acquainted with their parents and get them to come to church. So every week he had a church service in the park. Among the children that went to that church service was a little girl by the name of Betty, Betty went every week. She dearly enjoyed church. You can count on Betty being there. And one week as Pastor Black was having church there in the park, he noticed that Betty wasn't there. Didn't pay much attention about it, but the next week as he had church, Betty wasn't there again, and he asked the children about her, and they said, oh, Betty's very sick. And Pastor Black went on about his work, and the next week as he had church in the park, Again, he noticed that Betty wasn't there, and he asked the children again about her, and they said, Betty is very, very ill. And Pastor Black said, I must go see her. That week, about the middle of the week, he decided to go see Betty. He realized he had never been to Betty's home. He had never met Betty's parents. That he had actually never sat down and talked with Betty about Jesus Christ. And he purposed in his heart that he would do that. He went to the house, knocked on the door, and Betty's mother came to the door. And he asked to see Betty, and she motioned for him to follow her, and she took him to one of the back bedrooms, opened the door, and there laying on the bed was Betty. Pastor Black walked over and knelt down beside the bed, and in a very quiet voice he said, Betty, Betty, do you know Jesus? There was no movement. And believing that Betty was asleep, he said with a louder voice, Betty, Betty, do you know Jesus? But there was no movement at all. He realized that Betty was dead, stood to his feet, Walked back into the living room, and as he walked in the living room, Betty's mother said, are you the pastor that has church in the park? And he said, yes. She said, before Betty passed away, she gave us this note to give to you. The pastor took that note and walked back out into the park. And it said, dear Pastor Black, I just wanted to tell you how much I've missed church. I wanted to be there so bad, and I just couldn't come. But I want you to know that when the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. And as Pastor Black walked through that park, he wrote the words of this song. I want you to listen as Sylvia sings. When the 
Yeah.